Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Salmon of Doubt by Douglas Adams. Dane reads. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, an indispensable guide to life, the universe, and everything. This sublime collection dips into the wit and wisdom of the man behind the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uncovering his unique comic musings on everything from his school trousers to malt whiskey and from the letter Y through to his own nose via atheism, hangovers and fried eggs. Included here are short stories and 11 chapters of a Dirk Gently novel that Douglas Adams was working on at the time of his death. These hilarious collected writings reveal the warmth, enthusiasm and ferocious intelligence behind this most English of comic writers, a man who was virtually an unofficial member of the Monty Python team. Douglas Adams on his passion for P.G. Woodhouse, The Beatles and The Perfect Cup of Tea alone make this a must-have collection. It's a remarkable sign-off from one of the best-loved writers of all time. So here we have the prologue and this was written by Nicholas Rowe in The Guardian. And I just think this is an interesting uh, bit of information on, you know, some of the people he knew. Much of his wealth seems to have been spent fueling his passion for technology, but he has never really been the nerdy science fiction type. He is relaxed, gregarious, and a solidly built two metres tall. In fact, he has more the air of those English public schoolboys who became rock stars in the 1970s. He once did play guitar on stage at Earl's Court with his mates Pink Floyd. In a nicely flashed touch, instead of producing a passport-sized photo of his daughter out of his wallet, he opens up his impressively powerful laptop where, after a bit of fiddling about, Polly Adams, aged five, appears in a pop video spoof featuring a cameo appearance by another mate, John Cleese. And again, some more context on that, talking about the school he went to, Brentwood Prep School. The school boasts a remarkably diverse list of post-war alumni. Clothing designer Hardy Ames, the disgraced historian David Irving, TV presenter Noel Edmonds, Home Secretary Jack Straw, and London Times editor Peter Stottard were all there before Adams, while comedians Griff Reese jones and Keith Allen were a few years behind him. There are four alumni, two Labour and two Conservative, in the current House of Commons. In a scene that now seems rather incongruous in the light of Keith Allen's hard-living image, it was Adams who helped the seven-year-old Allen with his piano lessons. And this is interesting, it says, uh, Adams grew up in the 60s and the Beatles planted a seed in my head that made it explode. Every nine months there'd be a new album which would be an earth-shattering development from where they were before. We were so obsessed by them that when Penny Lane came out and we hadn't heard it on the radio, we beat up this boy who had heard it until he hummed the tune to us. People now ask if Oasis are as good as the Beatles. I don't think they're as good as the Rootles. And uh, this was just, you know, I guess I kind of relate to this as well just from being, I mean I'm 31 and my 10th book is coming out soon. He says, I felt like a mouse in a wheel. There was no pleasure coming into the cycle at any point. When you write your first book age 25 or so, you have 25 years of experience, albeit much of it juvenile experience. The second book comes after an extra year sitting in bookshops. Pretty soon you begin to run on empty. And I just thought this was cool. Um, he, this is a piece that he wrote about the book that changed me and he talks about Richard Dawkins. Um, and I, I've read this book, so title, The Blind Watchmaker, author Richard Dawkins. When did you first read it? Whenever it was published, about 1990, I think. Why did it strike you so much? It's like throwing open the doors and windows in a dark and stuffy room. You realise what a jumble of half-digested ideas we normally live with, particularly those of us with an arts education. We sort of understand evolution, though we secretly think there's probably a bit more to it than that. Some of us even think that there's some sort of god which takes care of the bits that sound a little bit improbable. Dawkins brings a flood of light and fresh air and shows us that there is a dazzling clarity to the structure of evolution that is breathtaking when we suddenly see it. And if we don't see it, then, quite literally, we don't know the first thing about who we are and where we come from. Have you reread it? If so, how many times? Yes, once or twice, but I also dip into it a lot. Does it feel the same as when you first read it? Yes. The workings of evolution run so contrary to our normal intuitive assumptions about the world that there's always a fresh shock of understanding. Do you recommend it or is it a private passion? I'd recommend it to anybody and everybody. Yeah, I'd recommend that book as well. Um, this amused me in a little piece he wrote about hangover cures. He said, incidentally, am I alone in finding the expression it turns out to be incredibly useful? It allows you to make swift, succinct and authoritative connections between otherwise randomly unconnected statements without the trouble of explaining what your source or authority actually is. It's great. It's hugely better than its predecessor. I read somewhere that. Or the Craven, they say that. Because it suggests not only that whatever flimsy bit of urban mythology you are passing on is actually based on brand new, groundbreaking research, but that it is research in which you yourself are actually involved. But again, with no actual authority anywhere in sight. Anyway, where was I? Uh, here's a little intro to um, some radio scripts. This was amusing. I do enjoy having these little chats at the front of books. 
This is a complete lie, in fact. What actually happens is that you are battling away trying to finish, or at least start, a book you promised to deliver seven months ago, and faxes start arriving asking you if you could possibly write yet another short little introduction to a book that you clearly remember writing the end to in about 1981. It won't, promises the fax, take you two minutes. Damn right it won't take you two minutes. It actually takes about 13 hours and you miss another dinner party and your wife won't speak to you and the book gets so late that you start missing entire camping holidays in the Pyrenees and your wife won't talk to you, particularly since the camping holiday was your idea and not hers and she was only going on it because you wanted to and now she has to go and do it by herself when you know perfectly well that she hates camping. So do I incidentally, I'm making this bit up. And then more faxes come in, demanding more introductions, this time for omnibus editions of books, each of which I have already written individual introductions to. After a while I find I have written so many introductions that someone collects them all together and puts them in a book and asks me to write an introduction to that. So I miss another dinner party and also a scuba diving trip to the Azores and I discover that the reason my wife isn't talking to me is that she is now in fact married to someone else. I'm making this bit up as well, as far as I know. He was, on, he was in Australia and he said um, he couldn't find anything to read. The hotel shop had only two decent books and I'd written both of them. So uh, this bit's called For Children Only and there's a lot of fun um, wordplay here. You will need to know the difference between Friday and a fried egg. It's quite a simple difference, but an important one. Friday comes at the end of the week, whereas a fried egg comes out of a hen. Like most things, of course, it isn't quite that simple. The fried egg isn't properly a fried egg until it's been put in a frying pan and fried. This is something you wouldn't do to a Friday, of course, though you might do it on a Friday. You can also fry eggs on a Thursday, if you like, or on a cooker. It's all rather complicated, but it, kind, but it makes a kind of sense if you think about it for a while. It's also good to know the difference between a lizard and a blizzard. This is quite an easy one. Though the two things sound very much alike, you find them in such very different parts of the world that it is a very simple matter to tell them apart. If you are somewhere inside the Arctic Circle, then what you are looking at is probably a blizzard. Whereas if you're in a hot and dry place like Madagascar or Mexico, it's more likely to be a lizard. This animal is a lemur. There are lots of different kinds of lemurs and they nearly all live in Madagascar. Madagascar is an island, a very large island, much, much larger than your hat, but not as large as the moon. The moon is much larger than it appears to be. This is worth remembering because next time you are looking at the moon, you can say in a deep and mysterious voice, the moon is much larger than it appears to be. And people will know that you are a wise person who has thought about this a lot. This particular kind of lemur is called a ring-tailed lemur. Nobody knows why it is called this, and generations of scientists have been baffled by it. One day, a very wise person indeed will probably work out why it is called a ring-tailed lemur. If this person is exceedingly wise, then he or she will only tell very close friends, in secret, because otherwise everybody else will know it, and then nobody will realise how wise the first person to know it really was. So I thought this was just an interesting little observation on language. It's kind of a common sense observation, but it's still well done, you know? When we say that something is startling, we mean that it surprises us a very great deal. When we say that something is a starling, we mean that it is a type of migratory bird. Bird is a word we use quite often, which is why it's such an easy word to say. Most of the words we use often, like house and car and tree, are easy to say. Migratory is a word we don't use nearly so much, and saying it can sometimes make you feel as if your teeth are stuck together with toffee. If birds were called migratories rather than birds, we probably wouldn't talk about them nearly so much. We'd all say, look, there's a dog or there's a cat. But if a migratory went by, we'd probably just say, is it tea time yet? And not even mention it, however nifty it looked. So onto the section, the universe. This is Frank the Vandal. And I just want to read the uh, first couple of paragraphs of this because it's uh, just amusing. I think it's done well. It's kind of meta, you know? The Macintosh came out five years ago and I seem to have had the builders in my house for almost that long. Someone asked me the other day what they were doing and I explained that I had been trying to pluck up the courage to ask them that myself. Things are rather complicated by the fact that one of them is an electrician called Frank the Vandal. That is, his friends, if he has any that aren't in hospital, call him Frank. And I call him Frank the Vandal because every time he needs to get at any bit of wiring, he tends to hack his way through anything else that's in the way to get at it. Plaster work, woodwork, plumbing, telephone lines, furniture, even other bits of wiring that he's put in himself on previous raids. He is, I'm assured, very good as an electrician, though I think he is maybe not very good as a human being. But I'm digressing here from the point I was trying to make, and I've rather lost the thread because Frank just cut the power off since I did the last save. So where was I? Ah, yes. And uh, he's talking about his writing progress here, he says, When I get back home with a finished piece, I can either copy it onto a floppy disk, assuming I can find one under the debris of half-finished chapters on my desk, then put that into my main Mac and print it, again, assuming that Frank hasn't been near my Apple Talk network with his chainsaw. Or I can try to do battle with the monster in the cupboard till I find another Apple Talk connector somewhere in its innards. 
or I can crawl around under my desk and disconnect Apple Talk from the 2X and connect it to the portable, or you get the picture, this is ridiculous. Dickens didn't have to crawl around under his desk trying to match plugs. You look at the sheer yardage of Dickens' output on a shelf and you know he never had to match plugs. And this is short but sweet and very apt, I think. He says, I've come up with a set of rules that describe our reactions to technologies. One, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. Three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. I'm coming up on 32, old dear. And I already don't use TikTok. And, um... Here, again, I think this is quite apt in today's climate. I don't accept the currently fashionable assertion that any view is automatically as worthy of respect as any equal and opposite view. My view is that the moon is made of rock. If someone says to me, well, you haven't been there, have you? You haven't seen it for yourself, so my view that it is made of Norwegian beaver cheese is equally valid. Then I can't even be bothered to argue. There is such a thing as the burden of proof, and in the case of God, as in the case of the composition of the moon, this has shifted radically. God used to be the best explanation we'd got, and we've now got vastly better ones. God is no longer an explanation of anything, but has instead become something that would itself need an insurmountable amount of explaining. So I don't think that being convinced that there is no God is as irrational or, or arrogant a point of view as belief that there is. So I don't think that being convinced that there is no God is as irrational or arrogant a point of view as belief that there is. I don't think the matter calls for even-handedness at all. That's an interview he gave with the American Atheists Association, and that leads on to his uh, fairly famous quote, which is that um, all opinions are not equal. Some are a very great deal more robust, sophisticated, and well supported in logic and argument than others. And uh, here he's talking about Richard Dawkins, and the two of them were friends. And I just find that interesting because I enjoy Dawkins' work, and so did uh, Adams. And Dawkins actually comes up again later on. And he says, uh, I became an agnostic, and I thought and thought, Biggie, Jesus. So I became an agnostic and I thought and thought and thought, but I just did not have enough to go on, so I didn't really come to any resolution. I was extremely doubtful about the idea of God, but I just didn't know enough about anything to have a good working model of any other explanation for, well, life, the universe and everything to put in its place. But I kept at it, and I kept reading and I kept thinking. Sometime around my early 30s, I stumbled upon evolutionary biology, particularly in the form of Richard Dawkins' books, The Selfish Gene and then The Blind Watchmaker. And suddenly, on I think the second reading of The Selfish Gene, it all fell into place. It was a concept of such stunning simplicity, but it gave rise, naturally, to all of the infinite and baffling complexity of life. The awe it inspired in me made the awe that people talk about in respect of religious experience seem, frankly, silly beside it. I take the awe of understanding over the awe of ignorance any day. Uh, so I'm going to read you this little introduction to the little computer that could. My favourite piece of information is that Bramwell Bronte, brother of Emily and Charlotte, died standing up leaning against a mantelpiece in order to prove it could be done. This is not quite true in fact. My absolute favourite piece of information is the fact that young sloths are so inept that they frequently grab their own arms and legs instead of tree limbs and fall out of trees. However, this is not relevant to what is currently on my mind because it concerns sloths, whereas the Bramwell Bronte piece of information concerns writers and feeling like death and doing things to prove they can be done, all of which are pertinent to my current situation to a degree that is frankly spooky. Uh, I also like the fact Bramwell Bronte, he could write two letters to two different people at the same time using both of his hands. We get a reference here to the way that QWERTY keyboards are designed and uh, there was a, a video by the a YouTube channel called Thoughty2 uh, which I pitched to write some scripts for. Didn't get the job but hey ho, it was a good video still, the one that he put out. So for the moment that leaves us back with the keyboard input and keyboard input for the moment means QWERTY. But QWERTY as we know was originally designed to slow down typists so the keys wouldn't jam. It's deliberately inefficient. However, all attempts to replace it with something more efficient, like the Dvorak keyboard, have failed. People know QWERTY already, and they don't have any pressing incentive to change. Dvorak AL may be better, but QWERTY is, or has been till now, good enough. If it ain't busted, don't fix it, is a very sound principle, and remains so despite the fact that I have slavishly ignored it all my life. This tickled me, just a tiny little piece on time travel here. Time travel? I believe there are people regularly travelling back from the future and interfering with our lives on a daily basis. The evidence is all around us. I'm talking about how every time we make an insurance claim we discover that somehow mysteriously the exact thing we're claiming for is now precisely excluded from our policy. And uh, this is another quite famous quote that does the rounds online. 
There are some oddities in the perspective with which we see the world. The fact that we live at the bottom of a deep gravity well on the surface of a gas-covered planet going around a nuclear fireball 90 million miles away and think this to be normal is obviously some indication of how skewed our perspective tends to be. But we have done various things over intellectual history to slowly correct some of our misapprehensions. Curiously enough, quite a lot of these have come from sand, so let's talk about the four ages of sand. And uh, it's an interesting little little essay there. And I like the fact, um, again, talking about atheism and whatnot, there's the well-known, like, turtle all the way down thing, so it's where the Discworld comes from, and also the title of the John Green book. Basically, uh, the, the, there was, like, this woman who goes, well, how can you prove that the Earth isn't carried on the back of a turtle through space? And then, and then uh, somebody's like, well, what does the turtle stand on? And it's turtles all the way down. Uh, and he kind of says, it's the same, we use the same thing for God, except it's God all the way up. Uh, you know, you, there's always has to be a creator for the creator, and it's, yeah. Right, I want to read this full bit here. I mean, this is from a speech he gave in 2001, so the year of his death. Uh, cookies. This actually did happen to a real person, and the real person is me. I'd gone to catch a train. This was April 1976 in Cambridge, UK. I was a bit early for the train. I'd gotten the time of the train wrong. I went to get myself a newspaper to do the crossword and a cup of coffee and a packet of cookies. I went and sat at a table. I want you to picture the scene. It's very important that you get this very clear in your mind. Here's the table, newspaper, cup of coffee, packet of cookies. There's a guy sitting opposite me, perfectly ordinary looking guy wearing a business suit, carrying a briefcase. It didn't look like he was gonna do anything weird. What he did was this. He suddenly leaned across, picked up the packet of cookies, tore it open, took one out and ate it. Now this, I have to say, is the sort of thing the British are very bad at dealing with. There's nothing in our background, upbringing or education that teaches you how to deal with someone who in broad daylight has just stolen your cookies. You know what would happen if this had been South Central Los Angeles? There would have very quickly been gunfire, helicopters coming in, CNN, you know. But in the end, I did what any red-blooded Englishman would do. I ignored it. And I stared at the newspaper, took a sip of coffee, tried to do a clue in the newspaper, couldn't do anything, and thought, what am I going to do? In the end, I thought, nothing for it, I'll just have to go for it. And I tried very hard not to notice the fact that the packet was already mysteriously opened. I took out a cookie for myself. I thought, that settled him. But it hadn't, because a moment or two later, he did it again. He took another cookie. Having not mentioned it the first time, it was somehow even harder to raise the subject the second time around. Excuse me, I couldn't help but notice, I mean, it doesn't really work. We went through the whole packet like this. I mean, there were only about eight cookies, but it felt like a lifetime. He took one, I took one, he took one, I took one. Finally, when we got to the end, he stood up and walked away. Well, we exchanged meaningful looks. Then he walked away, and I breathed a sigh of relief and sat back. A moment or two later, the train was coming in, so I tossed back the rest of my coffee, stood up, picked up the newspaper, and underneath the newspaper were my cookies. The thing I like particularly about this story is the sensation that somewhere in England there has been wandering around for the last quarter century a perfectly ordinary guy who's had the exact same story, only he doesn't have the punchline. And uh, here's an interview he did about the Hitchhiker's movie that was like famously always in production but never complete. He said, uh, is, is the idea that the movie will cover the first book? Yeah. It's funny because I've been looking around the web at what people have been saying. I've seen, he's going to put all five books into it. People just don't understand the way a book maps onto a movie. Somebody said, and I think quite accurately, that the best source material for a movie is a short story, which effectively means, yes, it's going to be the first book. Having said that, whenever I sit down and do another version of Hitchhiker, it highly contradicts whichever version went before. The best thing I can say about the movie is that it will be specifically contradicting the first book. And so then we get the title story, The Salmon of Dowell, which is like an unfinished, uh, I almost said Kirk Sandblast because I've been reading so much Ollie Jacobs. An unfinished Dirk Gently book. Um, and here we get basically people are travelling back through time to take resources from the past. And it says, it was only when it was realised that the present really was being impoverished and that the reason for it was that those selfish, plundering, wastrel bastards up in the future were doing exactly the same thing that everyone realised that every single Ioris rod and the terrible secret of how they were made would have to be utterly and forever destroyed. They claimed it was for the sake of their grandparents and grandchildren, but it was, of course, for the sake of their grandparents' grandchildren and their grandchildren's grandparents. Just a great little throwaway line here. Here he was, only 25, and already beginning to feel like he was almost 30. And uh, so Dirk says, um, business has been so slow, I've been reduced to looking up to see if they'd got my number right in the yellow pages and then calling it myself, just to check it was working. Okay. Yes, Dirk? You would tell me if you thought I was going mad or anything, wouldn't you? That's what friends are for. Are they? You know, I've often wondered. The reason I ask is that when I phone myself up, yes, I answered. Uh, again, just another quite well-written little paragraph here. 
A car, a blue convertible, sleek and desirable, came sweeping west out of Beverly Hills along the, as I understand it, gracious curves of Sunset Boulevard. Anybody seeing such a car would have wanted it, obviously. It was designed to make you want it. If people had turned out not to want it very much, the makers would have redesigned it and redesigned it until they did. The world is now full of things like this, which is, of course, why everybody is in such a permanent state of want. And uh, here, he, there's uh, part of an interview that he did, he says, You know what a learning experience is? A learning experience is one of those things that says, You know that thing you just did? Don't do that. And then uh, the epilogue is written by Richard Dawkins in The Guardian, because Dawkins was a, you know, a friend of him. And I just think this is sweet. He says, We shall plant a tree this very day, a Douglas fir, tall, upright, evergreen. It is the wrong time of year, but we'll give it our best shot. So yeah, all in all, The Salmon of Doubt by Douglas Adams. This really is like everything else by Douglas Adams. Uh, so it's a pretty good one to read after you've read Hitchhikers and Dirk Gently. Uh, I enjoyed it though. I would give this a pretty solid four out of five and it was a pleasure to read more Adams. I think I only have one or two books left now, so then I will have completed them all. But there we have it, that's what I made of The Salmon of Doubt by Douglas Adams. As always, don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.